Liz, you're muted. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Liz. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Liz Cidia Pereira, and I serve as the Chief of Equity and Inclusion for the City of Dallas. Thank you for joining us today for part two of our Black Lives Matter Community Conversations on Racial Equity, Justice, and Resilience series. Um, this series is a collaborative effort between the City of Dallas Office of Equity and Dallas Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation so that we can engage through dialogue with the community around current events and needs, uh, leading with race. It's our goal that the city's equity and inclusion team to center African-American voices as we strive to be better informed in our allyship and equity efforts. In this effort, the city is updating its resilience strategy, which is a seven framework that bridging equity apps in Dallas. We will share the link to our strategy in the chat box. It's our updated 2.0 strategy that uh, we're proposing, and we're proposing adding an eighth goal focus on public safety and law enforcement issues, such as restorative justice, legal representation, mental health programs, and more. We hope to gain the community's input in shaping the Resilience 2.0 strategy. Please keep an eye out as we roll out these uh, inputs and opportunities for you to provide input soon. We will also discuss the importance of resilience during our third Black Lives Matter community conversation on July 9th. So please uh, feel free to be there with us and tune in next week. With that being said, I look forward to having a productive discussion on the need for justice for the African American community with all of you today. I will now pass it off to Council Member Casey Thomas, who chairs the city's Workforce Education and Equity Committee and has been a strong champion for equity and inclusion efforts at the city. Thank you, Chair Thomas. Thank you, Liz. I want to say uh, good morning, everyone. We are excited about our second. Uh, of three series, Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Do Matter. They always have and they always will. I'm very excited about our session today. Today we have an outstanding panel and a phenomenal moderator who's going to lead our discussion today focused on justice. We are looking forward to all the great things that are going to be said, but more importantly, those things are going to be done. And so I want to thank you in advance, those who are serving on the panel. Thank you, moderator Wadley. We're looking forward to this discussion. So I'm going to get out of the way and I'm going to pass it back to you, Liz. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair Thomas. And I'm pleased and honored to introduce Professor Cheryl Brown Wadley, Professor of Law and Director of Experiential Education at the UNT Dallas College of Law. Professor Watley has over 40 years of extensive experience in advancing criminal justice and racial equity in our city and in other cities. She has worked on white collar crime, criminal defense, civil rights litigation, federal and state criminal defense, post conviction relief, and more through her position as the chief of economic crime unit at the US Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Texas and through private litigation practice. In addition, Professor Watley was appointed to serve on the Dallas Together, a mayoral committee appointed to address racial issues within the city of Dallas. In addition to her academic pursuits, Professor Watley currently works with the Centurion Ministries, a nonprofit organization devoted to the vindication and liberation of persons wrongfully convicted and imprisoned. It is clear through her life's work Professor Watley has dedicated her life to helping address the most pressing needs of our community as it relates to justice and equity. Please join me in welcoming the esteemed Professor Cheryl Watley.
I still believe in the justice system, even though it does not believe in me. I still believe in the criminal and the justice system, even though it does not believe in me. Those were words written by Tim Cole, a man wrongfully convicted of rape, who sat in a Texas prison until his death. Wrongfully convicted, but telling his sister and inscribed on his tombstone were the words, I still believe in the justice system. And so in our conversation today, while we're going to talk about policing, I wanna take a moment and encourage us to think about justice in the broader sense. As we know, and as we've heard over the past few weeks, we are at a critical moment in our society, in our country's history, where we are exploring our foundation, our beginnings. And when we do that exploration, when we look critically at the words of the Constitution that say part of the reason that we came together to form this more perfect union was to establish justice, let us be candid and critical and objective as we view our history. Let's be candid and acknowledging there is nothing very uh, just in the way we seize land from Native Americans and indigenous peoples in this continent to create the United States. There is nothing very just in the importation of Africans and to submit and create a system of slavery, institutionalization of slavery that has never existed in any other country. There is nothing just in the forced march of what we call the Trail of Tears. And so when we look at our goals to form this more perfect union, and as we say now, and this day and time, we are going to contribute our labors and our skills and our focus to create that more perfect union. Let us acknowledge that in the past, we have not been the just people that we claim to have been, and that we have taken from populations and communities and groups, and if, if we have been able to build this country because we have not all, we, we have been, we have built this country on some injustices that need to be corrected. And so we acknowledge even here in Dallas, as well as across the nation, we need to start getting it right because we have a debt we need to pay. And one of the debts that we need to pay are to people who are wrongfully convicted. And when we talk about our criminal justice system, we need to start focusing in on why does our system get it wrong? Why does our system make it so that black men are seven times more likely to be convicted of murder, wrongfully convicted of murder than white population? Or why are black individuals 3.5 times more likely to be wrongfully convicted of sexual assault? and 12 times more likely to be convicted, wrongfully convicted of a drug offense. Why is our system set up such that it gets it wrong so many times? And for me, an even more alarming statistic and one that I hope that we talk about a little bit today is that in 2016 and moving forward, while black youth were only 15% of the population, they were 35% of juvenile arrests. So what is it about our criminal justice system that has made it so difficult for us to achieve justice? That's what I hope that we'll talk about today with our panelists as we look going forward for people who have been involved in uh, the objective and critical review of the role of police and policing efforts here in the Dallas community. And with that, I'd like to begin with an introduction of our panelists and ask each one of them to uh, take a couple of minutes and introduce themselves. And let me begin with Ms. Tanya McClary, Monitor of the Office of Community Police Oversight. Ms. McClary? You're muted, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. And I'm excited to be here and be a part of this important discussion. Uh, my name is Tanya McClary, and I am the first police monitor in the city of Dallas. And I always like to tell people I am 40 years in the making. The residents of Dallas, the former board, 
the current board, the community fought to have an office of community police oversight. And so I take that role very seriously and I'm excited to be here. In terms of some of my other background, I've been a criminal defense lawyer for 25 plus years, a policy advocate and a community organizer. So I also like to call myself an activist lawyer because I know what it means to hit the streets as well as what it means to be in the legislative house as well as what it means to be in the courthouse and representing the people that the professor is talking about. So on the side of the defense and seeing firsthand how the criminal justice system has failed many of my clients. And so I'm excited to be here and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you. Dr. Grayson, if you would introduce yourself, please. You are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. All right. My name is Dr. Pamela Grayson. I am the director and founder of Collective is Activism, an organization that promotes activism on a holistic level. And we stick around after the cameras and other folks are gone. Um, I have been in Dallas for the past 10 years, an activist way before that, because even as an undergrad in college at my HBCU, the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, I ran the voters registration to keep a Bush out of office and we succeeded. Um, I am in alignment with your goals in regards to addressing the issues with our youth. Uh, one thing I'll share with you all a little bit later is the summer series of educational webinars we are holding. There is a problem and we're going to discuss equities, equities and justice. Then you have got to discuss the injustices and inequities within our education system, specifically for our black children. Um, I am honored to be here. Thank you. And I look forward to an entertaining conversation from which we actually glean value and solutions. Thank you, Dr. Grayson. Uh, Ms. Sarah McCurria, co-founder of Mothers Against Police Brutality. You, my screen keeps moving, so if you see me looking, I'm trying to find where you are on my screen. If you would please introduce yourself and share some information. Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah McCurria. I'm the co-founder of Mothers Against Police Brutality. I'm also the associate director of the Institute for Urban Policy Research at the University. I'm grateful to be here and I'm looking forward to a uh, insightful, bigger conversation with you all. Thank you. And Jess Arubo, Ino Bakahari Jr., if you would please go ahead and introduce yourself, sir. You are muted. All right, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to take part in this important conversation. My name is Jay Swa Robo Inabi Carey Jr. I am the chairman of the Dallas Community Police Oversight Board. I am also the chapter advisor for the chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha at Paul Quinn's campus, the Iowa Kappa chapter. And I'm also a community activist. Now I could spend time talking about myself, but I'm gonna take these few minutes to speak about something that very few people in Dallas are aware of, and that's the Dallas Community Police Oversight Board. I am the first chair of this board. This is a completely new board. This is something that the community has fought for for decades to get. This is a board that has the power to really provide true oversight to the city of Dallas, the Dallas Police Department. And so we are basically the voice of the community. We're working to, in creative ways of partnering with the community so we can provide um, oversight to the Dallas Police Department. Because as I said, oversight means that we get to draft and recommend policies that can reform the Dallas Police Department. And I think it's very important in this time in our country that we take advantage of these opportunities. This is an important time. This is a time for us to act. And this is a time for us to demand change. It is time for you to hold us accountable, hold me accountable. And I look forward to this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's kind of build upon those comments. And uh, Ms. McClary, can you tell us 
as the monitor for the Office of Community Police Oversight, what your office does and, and how the work that you do uh, reflects justice and equity as it, mean, as it means to you. So our office, um, someone once said this to me just not too long ago, and I loved it because it makes total sense. So I think most people understand what an internal affairs department is at a police department. It's kind of the division that is supposed to police from within. We're like the, subver the civilian version of internal affairs. We police from without. So when it says oversight, that's exactly what it means. So we oversee the activities of the Dallas Police Department. So I want to make it very clear to the community because there's a lot of confusion because our office has the name police in it that we are not uh, employed by the police department. We are not affiliated with them. We are an independent entity that oversees the activities of the police department. In to be the voice of the community. So I am your voice to any problems related to policing. And it is my job to hear what's going on with the residents of Dallas, to take that information and to translate it in ways that will hopefully push the police department to be better and to be more responsive to community. And so, for example, one of the things that I want to announce to the residents is that as of Tuesday, June 30th, there is now a new video release policy in the city of Dallas as it relates to body worn camera, dash cam footage as it relates to critical incidents and other issues. That has been a long time coming. The policy just in short says that the footage will be released within 72 hours. And our office was very crucial in helping to draft that uh, general order for the police department. And so that was a cry that we heard a long time where families have gone years, have never seen the footage of what happened to their loved one unless somebody leaked it to the press. And so a part of that is also to have the family members, if they can be contacted to see that footage before it's released. And so I'm very excited about that win, um, but that's what we do. And when, Professor, when you talked about what does justice and equity mean to me, we have to really be serious about giving oversight the tools and the strength that it needs. We are able to really affect change in a police department. And I know this is a new area for a lot of people when they hear about police oversight, but this was put into place, not just in recent years, but this has been going on for 40 plus years where people in the community have been seeking to get an inside to the police department. And now across the country, you have offices like mine that have the entree, that have the authority. My office has investigatory power. My office has subpoena power but we need the support of the community to leverage these things. And I also wanna talk about when we say equity and justice, we have to tell the truth. You know, I saw a wonderful t-shirt the other day that said, where was the slogan, all lives mattered from 1619 to 2020? And when I say that as someone that is a humanist, I care about every human being, but we have to tell the truth that this is impacting black communities and that's why we're talking about Black Lives Matter. It's not that we want to see anybody abused or killed by the police. But until we really step up when we talk about equity, that's why I love equity versus equality. Equity talks about let's distribute things based on what's needed. And what's needed is an acknowledgement about what has been happening to Black bodies since the beginning. And how even up till 2020, those issues have not been addressed. And so I want to be clear to the residents that I am here for everybody, not just the black residents of Dallas, but I want it to be known that we have to start telling the truth when we talk about some of these issues. And the vulnerable community that are impacted, which also includes our brown community, our undocumented communities, our LGBTQ communities. There are a lot of people that are impacted by what is happening with the police force. And we have to be able to help them have their voice, speak their voice, and I'm here to do that for you. And I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McClary. And it, might I add that not only do we have to be willing to speak the truth, we have to be willing to receive the truth. Yes. Yes. Because we aren't willing to hear, listen, and receive, then we're not really being true to the truth, right? All right. Uh, uh, Ms. McCuria, what, what are some of the inequalities that you've seen through the work that you've done, and how might we go about addressing those inequalities? Thank you for the question. Uh, we don't have enough time on this call to go through all of it. Uh, but one of the things that I think is important for us to think about is for too long, our framing has been within the context of the criminal system. And I say that because we use uh, the crime statistics as our metric of success in, in, in cities. And we know that only 10% of crime is even actually reported. We don't use well being, human well being, as a metric of success for a city. And so while Mothers Against Police Be has, since 2013, been advocating for accountability and transparency and looking for um, ways to mitigate harm uh, as it relates to the police department, we also push for alternative approaches. And I think this moment more than ever speaks to that piece of the conversation. How can we address the issues that our community is facing beyond a police interaction? So how do we, instead of criminalizing uh, people for being unhoused, how do we solve the issues that the unhoused are facing? How do we, instead of criminalizing people who are experiencing drug addiction, use the public health model to address uh, drug, drug addiction? At, uh, and most importantly, um, instead of criminalizing poverty in the city of Dallas, how can we create policies and programs that support people moving out of poverty and mitigate interaction with police? And so that, that's really the piece of the conversation that I would like to focus on. I could spend my time telling you a number of traumatic stories and over the years, I could tell my own, I can tell you those of uh, people who call Mothers Against Police Brutality in the middle of the night because they uh, call for help and um, are in turn victimized and traumatized by their interactions with police. But instead, I'd like us to focus on what are other ways that we as a city can address those issues, particularly talking about mental health, more about, uh, as I said, poverty, drug addiction, and um, homelessness. Thank you for reminding us that there are multiple problems that we need to figure out how to tackle and that the criminalization of the results of those other problems uh, has just is just one narrow area that we can touch upon. Uh, Mr. Ina Bakahari, you spoke about being chair of the Dallas Community Oversight Board. Uh, can you build upon those comments and explain exactly how th these issues with the police, the lack of justice, uh, the problems that we have in achieving justice, particularly harm communities of color? And you're muted again. Am I still on mute? No, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that, when we talk about justice, we have to start from the beginning. And when I say let's start from the beginning, let's start with the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment basically was a wink to former slave owners and um, racists that they could continue to enslave black men. There, we would be arrested for just looking at a white woman. We could be arrested for some of the 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 most obscure thing. And then not only that, but then they also use trickery to prevent us from voting, having to, to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar, or literacy tests, or, or having to pay a tax in order to vote, things that no other race had to deal with. So 
you, you talk about all of these injustices, and you look today, 2020, and you have companies now all of a sudden waking up and thinking, oh, we have black people in this country. And so now they are rushing to donate to HBCUs, and they are changing branding and slogans and things of that nature. As if for 400 years we didn't build this country, and, and we and slavery never existed, and the civil rights era never happened. So you have all of these injustices that are almost insurmountable. And then, so now we're in, in current day and age, we're talking about policing. And there's this thing called discretion. And there are a lot of calls that police make, and, and they have discretion in how they handle things. And that discretion itself has allowed for a lot of black men to be arrested and charged, tried, and convicted, whereas their white counterparts were let off with, with basically a warning. I mean, you have black men and women who have been in fatal encounters with police over minor traffic stops. And and I, I, I look at some of the glaring parallels. Tamir Rice had a toy gun and he died with he was murdered within a few seconds of a police officer seeing him with the toy gun. You have a white couple, I believe in Missouri, that basically were pointing military grade weapons at protesters as they passed by their home. And as far as I know, no one has been arrested. So, so when we talk about justice and, and, and injustice in policing, we have to go to the culture. We can't, when you start having conversations about a few bad apples, that's, that tends to diffuse the conversation. And we have to talk about the culture of policing and the history of policing, and that culture has to change. You can't put a black person at the top and think that you've done enough. Just because the black the police chief is black, that doesn't mean that all the issues of policing and Dallas has a history of it have been resolved. No, you have to go to the core, you have to rebuild, and it's gonna take those who have been victimized, those who have been oppressed to be a, to take part in drafting the policy to reform the police department. If you don't have the victimized group as a part of the conversation, building a solution, the solution would never work. And you see that by the history of this country. These solutions that have been showcased and brought out to, to address racism and to address injustice have usually been drafted by a group of white men. And as a result, a lot of it hasn't worked. I mean, we still have racism embedded in the structures and institutions of every institution in the United States whether it's health care, economics, and criminal justice. So it is time for those that are oppressed to be a part of the discussions and drafting the solutions. You're muted, Dr. Watley. Dr. Watley, you're muted. We can't hear you. Oops. You unmuted yourself and you muted again. Dr. Watley, I think you muted. Again, what did there I do? You are. You're good. I'm good now. Okay. Uh, your comments reminded me of uh, something that I was taught when I was in college and that those who are in power will never give up power easily. And where we're talking about police systems and police structures, it is more than just putting a person of color into those positions because those are positions of power. Now, certainly we have benefited because there's greater sensitivity. Hopefully there's greater insight, greater acknowledgement of communities of color by changes of, of uh, the personnel who are in those positions, but the positions have not changed. And so that's why we are at a very interesting time and place for conversation. Uh, Dr. Grayson, uh, you yourself acknowledge you've been in this battle, this struggle for years. Uh, is there anything, do you, do you think there's anything different about the types, quality, uh, the, the focus of conversations that we're having today than may have occurred in the past? 
Let me answer that with yes. Has there actually been a change? On August 28th, 2020, myself and a large contingent of Black America will be heading to DC for another march on Washington. 60 years later, we're still marching on Washington. And when I heard about it, I went and did research, excited, because I'm going to get to be a part of this. And the same signs my ancestors and my elders carried during that same march. I am a man. Pay me fair wages. Treat me as a human. That conversation is still relevant and happening today. So has it fully changed or has it changed? If you compartmentalize it, you'll pull out some changes. For instance, in religion or the church, there have been some changes. I'm the pastor's daughter, was raised to be docile and, you know, get married and all that stuff. Um, but today it is acceptable to stand up. And when you see powerhouses like my pastor, the incomparable Dr. Frederick Haynes, you have others, Bishop Talbert Swan, um, Bishop Rudy McKissick, but that conversation has changed in that now we have Dr. Uh, George Mason and also Mark Tirona. They are now speaking up. The church is somewhat speaking up better now, but you still have that evangelical pocket. Um, in addition, the church is better, not the best, but better at dealing with and the inclusiveness of the LGBTQIA community. You can compartmentalize it in education. Uh, like I said, my organization, we're doing some summer webinars and the educators I have from preschool, elementary, all the way to college, university educators speaking up and outright saying there is a problem. Now this from a occupation that once upon a time, if you were outside of your house after 9 p.m., you would get called on the carpet by your board. Now we've got teachers and educators speaking up about the lack of resources in urban communities. And then there are, due to the death of George Floyd, now we have conversations that are occurring. I have spoken to demographics I never previously had access to and I didn't even really know were willing to get involved. Um, we have groups now where you have the Caucasians and the Black folks talking to each other openly, correcting folks and giving, giving advice on how to handle these types of conversations. Um, I think that's good. Again, too, what I have done is I have set up a Google Classroom where if I can get a copy of this video, if it brings value, I will definitely post this there too, but resources for people so that they can learn the history and we can try to make the conversation substantive, have value, a positive outcome with tangible results. Um, and again, that goes to the value of the com conversation. I have committed that I will no longer entertain circular conversations. I'm not entertaining conversations anymore where nothing gets done. We just sit around, folks like to hear themselves talk, they pontificate, and again, we're beating the dead horse. Nothing happens. Today we'll beat the horse on the tail. Tomorrow we're gonna beat it on the head. Same result, you got a dead horse. The conversation needs to have value and be substantive. And I'm going to piggyback off of a couple of things I heard my counterparts say, uh, just a robo. We need to be in that conversation. He's right. We need to be in that conversation every time. And I love what Sarah had said earlier about the transparency of the police department. That needs to happen. Let's talk about that. You have the police have the open data uh, website where they put all that data out there. It's a mess. You knew what you were doing when you put it out there. You've got statistics statistics that don't even match how can you say somebody's race is hispanic but then when their ethnicity is not hispanic you've got trash intermingled in your transparency so overall has the conversation changed not entirely and not enough but is it has it changed somewhat is it evolving i believe so but again it's not enough it needs to be substantive and it needs to promote 
value, and tangible results and outcome. All right, thank you. So let me kind of try to pull some of these things together. We've been hearing about the calls for defunding the police, for reallocation of some of the dollars, which I think, uh, you know, are a significant portion of our city budget. How do we address what Sarah talked about as the wellness or the well being of our communities, create the substantive change that, that Pamela was talking about? And with the priorities of the oversight committees, what what can we do and what can we achieve if there is some reallocation of funding away from the police departments? What type of programming would you recommend? What priorities would you set for the use of those resources if that movement does actually take place? And you can, can Sari, yes, Ms. Mocha, Korea. Yes, I, I'm happy to jump in on that so the call to defund the police is um it's twofold one it is an acknowledgement that policing has failed us it has failed to keep the public's um any you know at my job uh, at, in motion um there are reviews and when you continuously uh fail to meet uh, the standard of, 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 um, of your uh, responsibilities, then there are changes that come. There are consequences that come. And every year in the budget cycle, what has happened is we pit senior services against recreation services, against library services, against home improvements, against all sorts of quality of life issues that create the vitality that we need in the community that would mitigate the need for uh, an enforcement arm like a police force to be an intervener. And so what we're saying is we need a radical shift make the front end investment in our community. And, and the question was, well, where do we start? Well, one place that we can start is mental health. Police are not equipped and have over and over again to meet the needs of people in mental health crisis. So I wanna uh, just highlight quickly the story of Jason Harrison. Jason Harrison, um, his mother called the police as she has done um, multiple times because her son who was schizophrenic uh, was off of his meds and she called for help to take him to the hospital so that he could be stabilized. This was a case that uh, was the first case that was caught on camera. Um, it, the first case, the first killing um, after body cameras were implemented in the city of Dallas. So what you see is Upon 10 seconds of arrival, two officers meet Miss Harrison at the door. She's holding her bag. She's not in distress. She's ready to go to the hospital to help her son get stabilized. You then see her move out of the screen. This is, again, this is happening very quickly. You see Jason Harrison appear. He's holding a screwdriver like this, this size of a pin. He's immediately yelled at, he's yelled demands or, or commands from, from officers uh, telling him to drop the weapon. Um, again, he is in a psychotic break. He is schizophrenic. You do not yell at people in, um, with those conditions. And the next thing you know, he shot five all on camera in front of his mother. This is a horrific, horrific event and it, it it exemplifies uh, why we do not need police officers as many responders. That is one way uh, we could move money from the police department into other areas, other programmatic areas. Another one is um, the criminalization of homeless folks. Taking homeless people to jail for sleeping in public, for public nuisance, does not solve the issues of the people experiencing homelessness. But what we could do is invest in affordable housing. What we could do, again, is invest in um, mental health services, drug programs, whatever wraparound services 
people who are experiencing homelessness need so that they can be served instead of uh, removed into uh, hysteric and, and, and criminalized. And so instead of criminalizing the existence of our residents as we, as we have done with youth through our uh, teen curfew, which creates an unnecessary touch point between people who are young or who appear to be young, uh, with police officers, we can look at policies and programs that meet the needs of our community members. And so that's why it's very important that we take a whole city approach. And that's why we focus on the budget um, as, as the document that we can utilize to uh, release the funds and, and better distrib distribute them to meet our needs. All right, thank and you. So I, I want to make sure, though, that when we talk about defunding the police officers, that that we remember or we keep top of mind that this is also an indictment on their failure as a, as a system to meet the needs of our community. Anyone else want to weigh in on the question? I, do. I think it's awesome. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Grayson. OK, I'm sorry. Um, what I would like to back up and do real quick is we assume everyone knows what defund the police means. I'm finding that they have twisted definitions of it. Let's be clear. When we say defund the police, we don't mean just give them no money and make them go away. That would be abolish the police. I know I personally can say that's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking for law enforcement to be abolished, but defunding. I totally agree with, because I want to defund and then refund. And I agree with most of the points that Sarah made. You can refund, do more for the mental health. I'm a trained mental health first responder. I will ride with the police to keep you from shooting folks. And then additionally, the dog catcher. We call the police for everything. We call them for a dog, we call them for a snake, a cat, actual issues, domestic violence, somebody's on my grass, everything. If we could pull some of that away from them and leave them to actually police. And then I take issue with the training they have received when it comes to de-escalation and problem solving. Our police are trained always to take the kill shot. There are situations where maiming should be an absolute option. Use your dog on taser. You don't have to shoot everybody in the chest or the head. Shoot in the legs. But unfortunately, we train them to shoot in the kill zone. And that, to me, is an issue. Perhaps you need to take a segment of law enforcement and teach them how to use their weapons differently and let them take these calls. Some of these simple calls should not have resulted in death. The child, and she talked about one individual, there's the child in Denton, who uh, clearly, if you're hitting a frying pan, using a frying pan to knock out lights, you clearly have an issue and somebody should have been able to discern that. And what type of a weapon is a frying pan? We've got to defund the police, fund other options or wraparound services. And then, yes, I think there's got to be a medium between how the police uses their weaponry. All right, thank you, Pamela. Tanya. I'm going to go ahead and let Sarah jump in first. I know she, I think she wanted to respond. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. Thank you. I, I just want to, uh, you know, with all due respect, Dr. Grayson, when I say defund the police, I mean defund the police in the same way that when we defund rec centers and defund libraries and defund senior services, I mean it in the, in, in the same way. And I think it's important that people understand that while the news and TV shows um, sensationalize crime to be murder and rape and all of these things, that's less than 3% of the the Dallas Department received. 65% of the calls that Dallas Police Department receives don't need to be answered by armed officers. 65% of 
calls by the Dallas police could be answered in other ways by social workers, by mental health professionals, by violence interrupters. And so what I, what we are pushing for is for a radical reimagining of how we uh, operate as a society. And, and thank you so much, uh, Ms. McClary, for allowing me to respond. And I like to say that's what I said. I'm in agreement with what you're stating. Ms. McClary. And I also want to bring our legislators in here. I don't want to let them off the hook. One of the things that um, Sarah talked about, these laws get enacted some kind of way. I mean, we are constantly over police. I will never forget, like when young black boys started wearing their pants hanging down, cities literally started having baggy pants laws. So then you had a whole generation of young black men that now have misdemeanor records because their pants were hanging down. Now, even now in the time of COVID, people are getting citations for not wearing masks and things of that nature. Don't get me wrong, and some of that could be coupled because it's a health issue, but my point is that it just brings more and more people into contact with the police, which justifies these enormous budgets. Because the more you criminalize things, we've criminalized, you know, I don't want to get into a discussion about legalization, but we've criminalized marijuana. Not just, I mean, in some places, we, you know, even if you just have seeds or just have a roach or just have debris, I mean, you're still open to criminalization. So we continue to, as just as Sarah was saying, we continue to just, you know, homelessness. Just, I mean, everything is a crime. And because everything is a crime, we justify why the police department needs to hire more officers, why they need more of this, why they need more of that. And so I want to put our legislators in this conversation. Why are you enacting laws on all of these things that just encourage the police to be in our communities? Because as Dr. Grayson, Grayson said, people are just calling. They just call the police for every single thing. And I have, as someone that has specialized in use of the force, the number of times when I've seen people be in force, I mean, we had a case in the city where I came from, New Orleans, where somebody ended up being tased in a diabetic coma. He was having a diabetic seizure and in an encounter with the police because they were called and the man was tased. I'm like, how does somebody get tased in a diabetic crisis? And so we have to think about these things. We have to say to our legislators, stop always trying to heed the cry of people and let's use some thought process when we just treat, keep trying to criminalize our way out of solutions where we should be putting some of this money. We are trying to police our way out community issues. If, if I could just say yes. something real quick. Sure, please. So we're, we're talking about defunding the, the police department. 80% of the police department's budget is salary. So that's about five. So the budget is about $500 million. And 80% of that is salary. So if you even take 10% of that, that's $50 million. $50 million they can go towards truly addressing public safety, addressing homelessness, addressing mental illness, uh, addressing poverty. Yeah, $50 million you can spread around towards that. And then a, a thing with training. So I, I talked to a close friend of mine and we were discussing policing. And, and one thing that we have to be very careful about, protect the status quo. Status quo has not helped us. And so we need to just forget about status quo and look towards a new reality. I want to say status quo. Status quo says, well, what are we going to do if there's crime? Who are you going to call? Okay, so we are not saying that when you defund the police department that there's no one, that there will be no one around to accept the call of somebody who's breaking into your home and things that make That's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is that throwing more money at police departments is not solving the problem. Case in point. There is no amount of training, no dollar amount of training that will get someone that should not be a police officer up to speed on being a police officer. One, you need to raise the standards of being police officers, meaning that we have to go with quality over quantity. We can't just start throwing bodies into the problem. We need people that can think critically. And I'm sorry, I don't want to insult anybody, but when I graduated from high school, I graduated third of my class. I wasn't the best critical thinker. I didn't learn those critical thinking skills until I was in college. So guess what? Probably seven times out of 10, 
A high school graduate does not have the critical thinking skills necessary to be a police officer. So we need to raise the standards. Maybe there needs to be some level of college education. I don't know. But and, and that for those that are a part of the oppressed to sit down and discuss and help to develop those policies. But what we have right now is not working. And if anyone tells you otherwise, they're being completely dishonest. And so, yes, defunding, I think, will be a good way towards helping with the reform effort. You know, I totally agree that there are, uh, policing is not for, being a police officer is not for everyone. And I'm not sure of all the psychological evaluations that should be done of every candidate, but I do know that every candidate who is accepted into uh, the possibility of being given the power and authority of a police officer should be well trained. And Dr. Grayson mentioned training earlier. One of the things that concerns me is a lot of police departments, including the one in Dallas, have facial training. And by that, I mean, they've got check the box training. They had a, a, a <clears throat> hour training on de-escalation. You sat through it, you watched the videos, you watched the demonstrations, check. They've been trained on de-escalation. Uh, there is maybe the two or three hour training on implicit bias, check. They've been trained on implicit bias. So now they know how to take that perspective out as they're, they're you know, driving around their beat. They have, there is a lot of check the box training required by T-Close and various police departments. But how do we make that tra training actual education? You know, I mean, how do we make it so that the police officers have actually walked the lives of the people that they are, quote, trying to police? And I, I would like to I see you raising your finger. I'm sorry. OK, let's talk about your training. I was on the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge on June 1st. And you know that was a horrendous night in the history of Dallas when we were all trapped on that bridge. And on that night, for these officers who have been trained on implicit bias and how to use the non-lethal weapons in the midst of a crowd that was laying down on the ground, we were getting ready to be zip tied to be arrested. An officer just roguely shoots a rubber bullet into the crowd. And he had to shoot it up because it came down and hit me on my head. I'm wearing this because I have a big knot on my head yet and still. Who does that? You did that out of callousness, insensitivity. I even talked to Chief Hall. I said, Chief, you know we're mad about some things and we are rightfully have a right to be so. Could you tell your officers to understand that? That should be a part of their training, but that was not the case. Your face training that you just mentioned is clearly not working. They need to, I think you need to kind of be a part of these types of conversations, work collectively, and we come out with actual tangible solutions from a conversation that actually holds value. And again, it's not just a matter of holding Chief Hall responsible. I know for a fact she's got dissension in her ranks. She's a black woman and they are giving that woman hell. Um, but I think she needs to hold them responsible by, again, an officer should be in this conversation. And another thing that needs to happen as far as the training and the defunding is you need to get rid of these police associations. Mike Mata, Police Association president is an issue. He is a disingenuous issue. I have had sent him a hot email on his bad behaviors out in public and they did change because he knew he was wrong. But these police associations are an issue as well. So when, it, when you're defunding, you're doing some better, more valuable training and do away with the fraternal organizations that protect each other. If I could say something. Yes, sir. So I, I think that that face train, that's really just check the box. That's the bare minimum. That the bare minimum they can say, hey, we did it from a from a I guess legal protection standpoint. But the, the problem is that that face training is not internalized culturally. So we again we have to talk about the culture. And 
the culture allowed for what happened on the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge. That was the culture. That wasn't the training. The culture is what allowed 400 plus use, excessive uses of violence and excessive force caught on camera throughout the protest. That's culture, not training. And so you have to look at this culture of policing. And we take we can take it back to the nineties during the the war on the war on drugs. That right there was a complete disgrace because of the fact that we had an opportunity to resolve an issue of chronic poverty, systemic poverty, and instead of folks on and also chemical dependency. We had we had the the opportunity to resolve those issues back in the 80s and 90s, and instead we chose to incarcerate. And that has led to a lot of children growing up without their fathers in the home because of that. And it's also led to a lot of tough on crime criminalization, tough on crime laws that have criminalized behavior that's not necessarily criminal and has allowed those who may have had a few strikes against them to be sent away for long, for long years because of something that was minor. And also it allowed for, again, white counterparts to also not fall victim to that. And so we have to look at these things and we really have to, and I, I'll keep saying culture because it is, it is the culture and that's the thing that we have to address. And we also have to look at the militar, militarization of the police department. Uh, I don't see a, a need for the Dallas Police Department to have a tank or for them to come to any any instance unless 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 there's some armed like unless there's some guys like like the movie Set It Off or some of these other movies where you know, they're armed with armor and and armor pills and bullets and all this that and other. There's no need for that. And you have police forces across the country that are militarized. They spend more time in tactical training than they do in training to de-escalate issues. There should be a commitment to do no harm. There should be a serious commitment to being de-escalators. And there needs to be a desire to be servant leaders, meaning that you shouldn't always feel as though someone has to comply. Someone may be having a bad day and, and they may not want to comply. And if, and if they're not in a position where they're causing the harm, you know what? De-escalate the situation. Use your training. Don't feel as though this is an ego battle. Sir, I'd like to respond to that. I don't know how you plan to separate training from culture. Because if you would look at the my, one of my favorite memes is you'll have a little black child and a little white child, and they'll tell you that hate is taught. You have to reteach, retrain in order to change the culture. The very conversations that I will entertain, we are reteaching, retraining, reading different mm -hmm. books, looking at different videos, understanding the history of redlining, understand the history of mass incarceration as to how we got here. So I, I disagree with that. You cannot separate teaching from or training from the culture. How I teach someone that is Caucasian and that thinks that all of us are on welfare, I go back to the numbers. I go back to what the USDA says. Who is really getting your food stamps? I got to teach that. Read this book. What big one now is Robin D'Angelo, White Fragility. Okay, read that. My favorite, Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law. Read that. You've got to teach and train in order to impact and change a culture. Right, but you got to get rid of the checkbox training. That's all I'm talking about. I, and I'm with you on that, but you said the training yeah, was important. It was just culture. I disagree with that because that's how we change culture is we teach them differently. I, and I just want to jump in. Training ain't doing anything. I, I right. want I want to jump in really quickly <laughs> to say that the best way to fight crime is to invest in our community. Again, we're we are focusing on 
police and I'm saying let's expand our m imagination beyond police being our solution. And as it as it uh, pertains to training and culture, I just want to read to you all a statement from the president of Chicago Police Union, who um, in conversation about uh, banning chokeholds, he said, I'm not going to give up my life because of, of some stupid department policy. And this is a culture across the country of lawlessness amongst law enforcement. And so what we need to do is focus our attention and expand our nation to invest communities to solve the issues that our communities are facing. Thank you, uh, Sarah. I like trying to look at uh, our Q&A boxes and we've gotten a lot of uh, input from attendees through the chat box. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box. And one of the questions that we have kind of builds on what Mr. Inabakahari was talking about in terms of education. And the question was raised whether or not there's a potential for developing a college degree that kind of addresses, I guess, more robustly these issues and pol uh, issues and topics of criminal justice, law enforcement, community policing, and providing scholarships to encourage uh, people of color to pursue those degrees. And I know so that 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 may look like it's putting the emphasis on policing, but might that be an opportunity to train the next generation of law enforcement so that they might become the mental health enforcement workers they might become whatever the the homeless workers as opposed to the strict traditional policing that we have today is the area of education perhaps an area of opportunity well i think we already You're, have must so be muted i can't hear oh, you i'm sorry oh am i oh. muted you can't hear me can you hear me now not now yes okay yes. Um, I was just going to say, we already have so many wonderful uh, opportunities for students to um, to pursue degrees in sociology, science, public health, social work. Those, uh, I, I am not interested in um, training the next generation of law enforcement. I am interested in um, closing the police academy so that we can uh, the next generation of social workers and mental health interveners and uh, and i can't even i i don't i i don't uh i don't have all the answers i think that we as a community have the answers that we need but i think that there is the opportunity for us again expand our imagination into who people should be, uh, what, what roles people should play. When we look at urban planners, less than 3% of urban planners are black. We need black urban planners. And when we talk about how we should expand uh, or how we should, um, how, how we should uh, inspire youth to study, I would say think about a holistic view of our of our community and our society. How do people become resilience officers? How do be, people become equity officers? How do people become urban planners? Um, and all of the other things that I've beyond just uh, overemphasis on policing. Our overemphasis on policing has created our overemphasis our over. Uh, over incarceration. We are the most incarcerated country in this world. So it's hard for us to think beyond it because every TV show, every every part of our society is about policing. When I look at, you know, I have a son who's 10 years old now, and when he would play with his Legos with his friends, they weren't playing doctor and lawyer and urban planner. They're playing cops and robbers on the playground. They play cops and robbers. We have this mentality that some people are good, some people are bad, some people are, you know, we talk about getting the bad guys or fighting crime. What constitutes a criminal? Somebody who was caught or all of us? Has everybody? Um, committed a crime? Have you 
have you uh, rolled through a stop sign or run a red light? Are you a criminal? Right? So we have to fundamentally shift the way we think about uh, crime in our community. And like I said earlier, I, I would push that we move to focusing on community well being as our metric of success and conversation. How do you, let me kind of build again on a, a question that has been posed in our Q&A. What role or what type of assistance can journalists and media give us in trying to affect this, this kind of transformative way of looking at uh, what our communities need and how can they help build community trust? How can our journalists and media help us think the stories that we need to learn about to make the changes that we're talking about? I think that is the goal of my or one of the goals of my organization is to address that. Um, at this point, I would believe that we need our own media outlets that tell our narrative, our way, from <laughs> our perspective, and our truth. Uh, I have a little one that won't let me be great. Okay, so I, I she, think she that, the reason you are great, <laughs> but you are right because he is the reason I fight the way I do. Um, but to to do that, I think there are certain news outlets and media outlets you're just gonna have to let go of. And then what irks me to no end is when people go and they use outlets such as blogs, white supremacist blogs, and we run with those at the as the gospel. There needs to be one, a standard by which we use media, information and two at this stage in the game i think we need our own i know chance the rapper just bought a station in chicago um what's our guy colin kaepernick he just either bought a station or tv stations or something like that um i i really think we are going to have to develop our own outlets that will ensure our story is told from our truth and our perspective thank you sarah you i think the, the media and uh, journalists they can be the storyteller however they get distracted very easily and i i'll, I'll tell you why Colin Kaepernick started a, a protest against police violence and injustice. And the story quickly turned from his protest against police violence and injustice to him being disrespectful to the flag and him being disrespectful to soldiers. And then it, it changed from that to a protest about NFL teams hiring him. So the media takes a good story and sometimes it will shift and pivot. Meaning, for instance, the, the protests that, that have started, we are in a historic time. There were protests in every state of our 50 states. And the conversation was whether there are riots, whether the protests are violent or not, and not the issue that's being protested. So the media can tell the story, but a lot of times it doesn't because the story is about the injustice. That is the story. The injustice, the historic injustice and inequity in this in this country. And if your story says anything other than that, then you're not telling a story. In every specific community, and the African American community has specific personal stories of their struggle to get equity and their fight against injustice and, and how they've been oppressed. And those are the stories that need to be told so that the country truly sees the reality that there are citizens in this country that aren't living as comfortably as you are. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> police reports and police narratives and how those too often become the news stories that we see on television. We have no audit process for police reports. So police reports um, are written and then um, because they are official state documents are written and, and taken as truth with a big T. 
and this is very problematic. So they're they're written as um, truth with a big T, and then they are propagated throughout the media and onto the news as truth when they are one side of a story. Too often, um, as is the case with um, deadly use of force, there's only one side of the story unless there are witnesses or video um, th that that speak for the other side. And so I think that uh, I, I put in the chat, Color of Change is doing some work around media responsibility, but I think even further, we need to further investigate how we can create audit processes for these police reports. And I, I know um, uh, Ms. Tanya can speak to uh, and, and all and and you as well, uh, Ms. Cheryl. Around uh, any criminal defense attorney can tell you about uh, uh, the lies that sometimes show up in these police reports that are written as truth. And so that is a fun fundamental issue, and especially um, especially we especially with uh, organizations like the Dallas Morning News and others, we need some accountability that these stories are not being told as as truth, but are um, are being acknowledged as one side of of a story that um, is often developing, right? When there is a, a use of deadly force or excessive force, um, we're still having to work out what happened in that moment and we have to, you know, of course, as, as, as a, a community, we want to know instantaneously, but it needs to be shared in a way that acknowledges that this is not truth, that this is one part of a developing story. Absolutely. And certainly the videos that we have seen come out more and more often have shown the lies behind the police reports the manufacturing of evidence. But I want to move us along quickly because we've gotten some great questions here. What can the community do? How do we exercise political will to uh, get our elected officials more responsive to becoming involved rather than just kind of by default, leaving it to nonprofits to perhaps raise funds and provide the services that city agencies aren't doing? What can community the community well, about what can people do to get involved in this call for our city to address some of these issues so i'll just give a uh well one of the things I'm response. Saying, uh, um, is to come uh, wait, wait, we've got to wait we've got two people sarah let's we'll let tanya talk and then we'll come to you sarah one of the ways is to get involved you know i love to flip around that saying that our government uses if you see something say something but we want you to say something Come and say something to our community, to our offices, to Sarah's office, to my office, to our board. That's how we uncover a lot of these injustices. You don't know the amount of complaints that I get that talk about how their police report was not correct. The number of complaints that say, this is what the officer said to me or did to me or whatever. I mean, we have some of this way we change policy is through anecdotal stories because when you get so many of them, it points to a problem. And so one of the ways is to voice. And, but I also do want to acknowledge that I know for some people that's scary. Some people don't want to put their name out there to the police department, but you have to do it. We have to be able to know what is going on with you in the community. And to also call your legislators out. Your legislators are supposed to be responsible to you. Make appointments to see them, talk to them about what your issues are and what your concerns are. But we have to be able to speak up so that we know what the issues are. Your legislators know what the issues are because the louder your voice is, the harder it is for people to sweep stuff under the rug. So we need you to amplify your voices in unity around a lot of the stuff that's problematic in your communities. All right, thank you. Sarah. Yes, and I would just add uh, an immediate thing folks can do is get involved in this budget process. So the budget is released on August 11th and there will be two weeks of most likely virtual um, town halls about the budget where your priorities um, can be voiced. Uh, you know, everybody, everybody uh, that works for the city of Dallas is a public servant and they work for us. They are, we are their bosses and we have to show up and, and, and um, share our priorities. Um, other, you can get involved beyond the, the budget 
discussion is join organizations and coalitions that are doing this work. Mothers Against Police Brutality, Our City, Our Future, In Defense of Black Lives Coalition, the Coalition for Oversight. There are so many ways to uh, get involved in terms of advocacy, um, but I think the beauty, or not the beauty, that's the wrong word, but um, the unintended benefit of this COVID-19 moment is that we have more access to city council. Generally, uh, people who during the day are able to go to city council meeting. Now that we've moved to a virtual platform, there's the opportunity for more people to get involved. Uh, the city council is on recess during July, but mark your calendar for August and get involved, mm -hmm. show up and share your voice. So if I, if I could say something. Briefly, yes. Okay. Yeah. So. A lot of times people don't want to get involved until something happens, such as now. Now, one of the things in regards to, I, I would say for all of the residents, look around. Is your, are your elected officials speaking on these issues now? Or are they trying to seek solutions now? If not, then they need to be, they need to be elected out. Or um, have your, has your elected official been speaking on these issues? Are now all of a sudden are they speaking on it because of the fact that it's election time? If so, they need to be voted out too. The thing is, is that we all have to be a part of the solution. I know with the oversight board, we are allowing members of the community to partner with us on a number of committees to help to draft, not only this help us draft policy, but it also allows us to hear and see what's going on, on at the ground level. If you have someone that is close to the pain, then they will be able to help with distributing the power. And that's what we need. We don't need those in power that are so far removed that they can't even make the right decisions for those who they represent. When you talk about good and bad people, those are bad people because of the fact that they're making decisions that don't affect them, but that negatively affect those who they represent. And so, especially in this election season and every election season moving forward, we have to make sure that we are electing those who truly represent us, who truly stand for us, and who truly believe in the issues that we believe in. Okay, so let's build upon one of the questions that was asked, and that was, with respect to these conversations and this conversation in particular, what would we like to see as an outcome? What would we like to see just, and, and I've heard the call to action uh, to contact your city council representatives, but are there other concrete outcomes that we would like to see that we might be able to put forth to the community to ask them to get involved with? What do we want to come out of the time that we've spent today? Um, I would like a push towards, uh, like I said, tangible outcomes. Let's do the defunding. And let's put money towards the other applications that we have discussed. Um, continue to push not just conversation, but actual education. I think the city, if you want to sit here and say that your goal is to, is to, um, to, to fix this, then let's do the training and the education community-wide that needs to occur. Um, the folks up in Highland Hills and in these northern sections, they need to understand what's going on down in Oak Cliff and be able to empathize and relate and work to understand it. And I also am pushing for 1% uh, of the budget to go to the police oversight office so that they can genuinely do what they need to do. Let, let me follow up with that. And I know, Sarah, I think you want to respond to that earlier question. but. Do you know of any um, organization that has actually published an alternative budget for allocation of funds that are being shifted from the police department or part of the defunding to uh, specific allocations of programming? Uh, Pamela, you talked about 1% for the oversight office. Sarah, you're nodding your head, yes. So, um, so our city, our future last year uh, worked on, on the city budget and is doing so this year too. Um, as a as a collective, um, we are rolling out an opportunity for folks to self uh, 
self-organize virtual meetings like this to discuss what their priorities are during the month of July in, um, in anticipation of the August meetings on the budget. So um, the In Defense Coalition for Black Lives is also working on a people's budget. And it's not for us as organizations or uh, activists or organizers to say what the community needs. It's for us to collectively work out through democracy uh, what we want. What kind of city do we want? You know, a, I think it was just last week, the last Confederate monument in Dallas was taken down. We have decided that we no longer want um, monuments to white supremacy in our public square. What kind of art do we want in our public square? What, what kind of city do we want? And I think that for me personally, uh, I want to I want to create a baseline where we don't have neighborhoods that don't have access to grocery stores. I want a baseline of um, streets and and sidewalks across the city. These are baselines that I think are important. I want fully funded art and cultural programs uh, that that inspire and help heal. Um, our, our residents. So those are things that are important to me, but I think that we all have to say what is important to us and what we need. And the best way to get involved is through organizations like Our City, Our Future, In Defense, uh, In Defense of Black Lives Coalition, and showing up in these budget conversations in, in August. And so I think that this is something that we all need to, we all need to participate in. And there are other organizations as well. The Coalition for Oversight has this as well. And it's to my understanding, even Next Generation Action Network put together something as well. So there are multiple out there, but we don't need silos. We need for everybody to hopefully work together. And that would be great. And I think that collective impact would be more substantive. And you're also going to be hearing this month, um, we're hoping that a lot of you will join our Community Police Oversight Board's meeting, which is going to be on July 15th at 5.30. That's going to be one of the topics that the board is going to be discussing. And I'm sure, Jason Robo, you want to jump in on that. But we're also going to be doing a call um, at least once or twice this month to hear from the residents of Dallas. What do you want in terms of reform? If you could defund the police department, what is it that you want to have with the resources? But I also agree with Dr. Grace, and hopefully we can pull all of us together at the table and come up with maybe one document that says, here is what the residents of Dallas really want. And so um, you will be hearing a call from the oversight part of the community, but I agree, Dr. Grace, and maybe there's a way for us to pull all ourselves together to come up and with if a you, And if you want to work on that, Tanya, I will work with you. I'll put in the work with you. We can bring it together. I'm sure I can get hopefully a space for us to speak here, uh, meet locally, if that's something that you don't have available, and we could do it. A representative from every organization, sit around the table cohesively. And see, that's the problem. Some of these organizations you can't work with because they're so difficult to work with and it's all about them. But if we can get them to work together cohesively, we would have more impact. Let, let me follow up. If someone were to take your challenge to try to create a an opportunity for the involved organizations to come together to try to achieve this cohesive voice. How would you identify the organizations and individuals to whom you would need to make that outreach? I mean, I've got me. I've if you've been at this, I've literally been making a list of the names of organizations that that you've put out. Uh, but I'm curious. Uh, I'm listening to you. That's how I'm learning. How okay. do we, how do we do this? You have an entire coalition that has about 30 organizations that came together when to perpetuate the change with the CPRB, the Community Police Review Board. You have local organizations. If you've been at this long enough, you can sit down with about two or three people in the community and they will be able to engage you to everybody. This right. is just word of mouth. But to the extent we're trying to bring in the 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 people who are newly arrived to this. So I think that there are many entry points and um, I, I love the idea of everybody working together and I'm always open for it. And I also know that, um, I also know that uh, 
it it doesn't always happen. We don't we can we we don't always get on the same bus, but we can always move in the same direction. So I I think that um, the best way to do it is for people to find organizations, groups, people that align with their values, their missions, and join. And I and as I said, I put my email and um, I see my my uh, media tags are in the ch in the chat box. Um, please join. I think moving moving towards justice is all of our goals. And so, however and wherever people want to fit in, um, I think is is the best idea for people. I, I mean, I'm open to it. And like I said, our the organizations I named, the coalitions that I named, are open and embracing to everybody to to join. I also have worked um, a lot with Changa on. Um, over the years, we have multiple decades long relationship. Mothers Against Police Brutality chaired um, the research document that helped provide the research that moved the, um, that, that was a basis for part of the um, oversight coalition's um, push for the the making of the oversight board and so there's a long history of people working together in the city and i hope this is a moment that we can continue to do so thank you and this is tanya one of the things i want to say and sarah i'm so glad you're on the call we have not had a chance to meet yet is that one of the most important organizations one of the most important accomplishments i want to say is when i was in new orleans doing oversight was creating the, the kind of sister group to what Sarah has created, families overcoming injustice. These were family members who all had loved ones killed by the New Orleans police. It is so important that they are helping to lead this charge around ending police brutality. One of the things this amazing group was able to do was develop a family bill of rights. It's unprecedented. I believe it's one of the first in the country where they have demanded that the police department give every family that's involved in a critical incident death certain rights. And we need to push for that. We need to push for groups like this to have a voice while we're defunding and doing other things to be at the table, to be making policy decisions about what happened with families. And so I wanna put those voices into the space. Obviously, Sarah is here representing those voices, but the importance of them not only on the outside advocating, but the point of them having places inside the department and helping to push change from the inside. And I appreciate, I appreciate you saying that because that is really why Mothers Against Police Brutality started to create to the table for us. Um, my father was killed by Dallas police officers who still work for the Dallas Police Department as detectives. And so um, this is uh, our, our way of pushing for justice. This is my way of pushing for justice because justice wasn't found in the courtroom um, for me, and so uh, I appreciate that uh, that offer, and, and we are happy to work with you. And as I said, happy to work with everybody on this. I can't believe it, but according to my clock, we have come up. Uh, we are within two minutes of uh, of reaching the end of this session and this conversation. Uh, it has been an incredible conversation. I I feel constrained in saying, can, you know. Is there something that you can say within 30 seconds uh, that will hopefully inspire the listening audience to help us continue not just the conversation, but to achieve the outcomes, to achieve the uh, presentations at the budget hearings that help us keep these issues alive? And I apologize, my clock now says 1229. So is there someone who, who just... Dr. I, I, I'm going to read a quick post that I made the other day. Here it is. While I appreciate all the street painting, Confederate monument removals, preliminary attempts at changes in policing, diverse protesting, exponential corporate donations, where is that money going? And the hard conversations increasing, these are all dog and pony shows without significant policy change. The thing I hate about activism today is that when we seem to push a cause as long as it's in vogue, the oppressor has learned to minimally placate us, then wait us out till our collective ADHD kicks in, we lose focus, and then on to the next, which basically lets them off the hook. We need to keep at it. 
And I think the challenge is my clock says 1230 and I don't know if there's a hook that literally takes us off or not. I think the challenge is to make sure the spotlight, the calls for accountability and the focus continues. You all have stated that so eloquently. You've set forth the call. We've identified potential outcomes. Everybody, let's make this an issue before the budget hearings. Let's take this opportunity to work with the oversight board and to uh, reach out to our elected officials. I think that's, I, I don't know how this timing works, but I oh, see that you. it's 1230. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Watley. We thank you, Professor Watley. Awesome thank you and all the panelists. And thank you so much. And our thank ASL you, interpreter, you, Laura Tovar. Thank you very much for interpreting for us today, Loda. Yes, thank you so much. Thank and you. all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Stay well. Thank you. Bye.